violence shattered the forests west of the Appalachian Mountains in the spring of 1763. The peace brought on by the end of the French and Indian War, which gave Great Britain control over much of the continent, disintegrated in what became known as Pontiac's War or Pontiac's Rebellion. The clash of cultures and territorial ambitions ignited a war that reverberated with the determination of those seeking to safeguard their ancestral lands. As the British sought to consolidate their gains in the wake of the Seven Years' War, native tribes led by the indomitable Pontiac stood resilient, challenging the imperial juggernaut. In this chronicle of conflict, the Great Lakes became a battleground where survival and sovereignty hung in the balance. But what tales of valor and sacrifice unfolded amidst the clash of empires? And how did Pontiac's leadership shape the destiny of native resistance against British expansion? Stick around as we unravel the full details of the Pontiac War, dig into its root causes, and how it was brought to an end. As you watch this video, help us hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. Thanks for joining us once again. The beginning of unrest that led to Pontiac's rebellion started well before the French and Indian War. However, the uprising directly resulted from how the British treated the Indians between the capture of Fort Niagara in 1759 and the spring of 1763. In 1759, British forces captured several forts in the Ohio country that were critical French positions. And on July 7, 1759, British forces began a siege of Fort Niagara near present-day Youngstown, Ohio. Around 900 Iroquois warriors joined the British under the command of Sir William Johnson. On July 20, the commander of the British forces was killed in an accident, and Johnson assumed command of the entire force. On July 23, Johnson learned a French force was on its way to reinforce Fort Niagara. The next day, the British and their Iroquois allies ambushed the French, who were soundly defeated and surrendered. With no hope for reinforcements, the French commander, Captain Pierre Pouchot, surrendered to Johnson on July 26. The fall of Fort Niagara to the British caught the attention of the tribes allied with the French. They began to think the French could not win the war and looked for ways to put themselves on good terms with the British. The British also looked to gain the favor of the Indians they had been fighting against. In August, George Krogan held conferences with leaders of the tribes to create an alliance. Following Native American Indian tradition, Krogan smoked the peace pipe with leaders from the Delaware, Shawnee, Ottawa, Miami, and other tribes. One of the chiefs of Ottawa, Ulami, went so far as to promise that Ottawa would never again make war against the British. Krogan spent significant time cultivating the relationship with the tribal leaders and preparing them for what seemed inevitable the British would be in control of New France. Krogan held another conference at Fort Pitt, and roughly 1,000 people from the Western tribes made the journey. They were told the British would not take their land, and they intended to resume trading with them. The promises came in the form of a letter read to them. The letter was from General Geoffrey Amherst, Commander-in-Chief of His Majesty's Forces in North America. While the letter was read at Fort Pitt, Amherst and his forces were pushing the French forces in Canada back to Montreal. On September 8, 1760, the governor of New France, Pierre Rigaud de Vaudreuil, surrendered Montreal to the British. With the city under their control, the British successfully conquered New France and significantly expanded their territory in North America. On September 12, 1760, Amherst ordered Major Robert Rogers and two companies of his rangers to go to the French forts throughout the frontier, receive their surrender, and raise the British flag. Krogan was also sent out to meet with the Indians to let them know the British had won the territory, and they were considered British subjects. He also spread the message from Amherst, which promised the British would resume trade with them and not take their land. The British created additional goodwill with the Indians by supplying them with ammunition for their weapons. In the spring of 1761, the Indians grew frustrated with the British. When the trading season opened, the Indians had plenty of furs to trade, but the British brought products the Indians were not interested in and also limited the amount of rum they could trade for. The Indians also felt the British charged prices were too high and unfair. Johnson tried to alleviate the situation by providing Amherst with a list of items the Indians wanted to trade for 
and he tried to negotiate better prices, especially for the Indians who lived with the tribes in the vicinity of Fort Detroit. Amherst assured Johnson that he would do what he could to keep the peace with the Indians. However, Amherst felt the British were giving too much and bribing them. Amherst did not understand the system of trade and gifts as part of the Indians' tradition. The French had understood it, and so did men like Johnson and Krogan. It was not, as Amherst called it, a system of bribery, but a system of hospitality, friendship, and respect. Rum was a significant issue for the Indians as well. The British used rum to their advantage when the French were still involved in the fur trade. They made it easy for the Indians to buy it, letting them buy as much as possible until the inventory ran out. This helped give the English an advantage over the French. After the French were subdued, the British started to limit where the Indians could purchase rum and the quantity they could purchase. In order to enforce the new policies regarding rum, the British required all trading to be done at the forts, which upset the Indians. In the past, British traders had taken their products and rum to the tribal camps and villages. The Indians had to travel to the British forts to conduct trade. Amherst continued to make the situation worse when he gave some land near Niagara to some of his officers as a reward for their service in the fighting against the French. This upset the Seneca tribe and resulted in them carrying a red wampum belt, a war belt, to other tribes in the east. The Seneca asked the others to join them in declaring war on the British, and they proposed simultaneous attacks on British forts at Detroit, Pittsburgh, Presque Isle, Venango, and Niagara. The Seneca traveled to Detroit, where they invited the Western tribes to a council so they could present their plan to them. Soon after the Seneca reached Detroit, the commander of Fort Detroit, Captain Daniel Campbell, found out about the plot and immediately sent letters to the commanders of the other forts to warn them. Campbell also sent a French trader to spy on the Seneca. The trader infiltrated the council the Seneca held where they presented their plan. The council took place on July 3 and was led by two Seneca chiefs, Kayachita and Tahayadoris. The local tribes were not ready to turn their backs on the British despite their grievances. When the council was over, they told the Seneca they would respond the next day, but they would give their reply at the fort, out in the open, in front of Captain Campfell. The next day, the local tribes gave the Seneca war belt to Camp Bell. The Seneca were embarrassed but responded by stating their grievances against the British. Campbell told them to stop their scheming and return to their home in western New York, which they did. However, the seeds had been planted for the coming conflict. In May 1761, Krogan and Johnson met to discuss the situation with the western tribes. They understood the tribes were not pleased with the new British policies, and they wanted to do what they could to resolve the situation. This was followed by Amherst traveling to Albany to meet with Johnson. Between the two meetings, it was decided Johnson and Krogan would go to Detroit and hold a council with the leaders of the Western tribes. After Amherst left Albany, he sent a letter to Joson dated August 9. Amherst told him to stop the practice of purchasing the good behavior of the Indians and to limit their access to ammunition. Amherst was concerned the Indians, all of them, not just the Western tribes, would turn on the British and use the ammunition against them. Amherst also decided while Johnson was meeting with the Western tribes, an expedition would be sent to occupy the posts at Michele Mackinac, Green Bay, St. Joseph, Sandusky, Miamis, and Uyatanon. Major Henry Gladwin would lead the expedition to the forts. Amherst instructed him to review each post and leave as many troops as necessary. He also told Gladwin to follow any recommendations he received from Johnson in terms of dealing with the Indians. On September 9, Johnson's council with the Western tribes started. Johnson said he was there to strengthen the chain of friendship between them and the British. He assured them they would not be deprived of more land than was necessary for the purpose of doing business with them, or the British held a lawful claim to. Per the custom of the Native American Indians, they waited until the next day to respond to Johnson. On September 10, the tribal leaders told Johnson they supported him and Amherst and they would be loyal to the British. Johnson responded the next day by presenting the tribal leaders with gifts and a feast that featured a roasted ox. After the council, Johnson prepared a long list of the terms of trade and sent it to the commanders of each post 
with instructions to keep up a good understanding with all Indians. He also encouraged the commanders to keep in touch with each other and to use an interpreter so they would be sure to comply with the terms of trade. Johnson returned to his home in New York in October and wrote to Amherst. He told him he was confident he had been able to broker a long-lasting peace and alliance with the Western tribes. Around this time, Pontiac started to speak out against the British. He accused them of altering the terms of trade and criticized them for their restrictions on access to rum. He was concerned when Captain Campbell, still in command at Detroit, found out that Amherst had stopped the tradition of giving gifts and limiting access to ammunition. He wrote to Bouquet at Fort Pitt and asked if he could send ammunition. Campbell intended to provide the Indians with ammunition if it would prevent hostilities. Johnson and Krogan agreed with Campbell, but Amherst continued to hold to his policy of denying gifts and ammunition. The Western tribes had left the Arie for their winter hunt, so there was peace. However, Campbell, Johnson, and Krogan were concerned about what would happen when they returned in the spring. In the meantime, the British garrisoned the posts and forts throughout the frontier and increased their military strength. The Western tribes returned in the spring of 1762 and quickly realized their understanding of British policy differed significantly from Amherst's. They wanted rum and ammunition, and both were in short supply. There was another concern among all the Indians, and that was that Spain had joined France in the Seven Years' War against Britain, which led to Britain declaring war on Spain on January 2, 1762. There were rumors that the French and Spanish would send a combined force to retake Quebec and drive the British out. At Detroit, Campbell tried to smooth things over by providing more rum and gunpowder than he was supposed to. On July 3, he wrote a letter to Bouquet and said if Amherst continued to refuse to give gifts, including ammunition, to the Indians, it would only be a matter of time until there was an uprising. The French took advantage of the situation and started to spread rumors among the Indians in the West and East. The French told them the British intended to eliminate them, and the proof was in the fact that Amherst had limited their access to ammunition. Amherst sent expeditions out to explore the new British territory to the south. He also commanded Major Gladwin at Fort Detroit and transferred Captain Campbell to the fort at Sault Ste. Marie. Gladwin arrived at Fort Detroit on August 23. 1762. Soon after, rumors began that the Indians were plotting against the British. On September 28, an Indian from the Detroit area visited George Krogan in Pennsylvania and said he had heard a secret council had taken place at an Ottawa village. At the council, two Frenchmen addressed leaders from the Ottawa, Chippewa, Huron, Potawatomi, and other tribes. He told Krogan he did not know what the French said but messengers had been sent to other tribes. Krogan heard similar rumors from some Iroquois men he knew. He sent letters to Amherst and Johnson and told them what he had heard. In December, Krogan found out that earlier in the spring, the Shawnee had received a war belt and hatchet from the Wee tribe. It had been given to the Wee by the French. Krogan sent a letter to Joson and told him that war was likely coming with the Indians. Fortunately for the British, the Indians did not excel at working together and were usually distracted by hard feelings and jealousy from earlier conflicts. It was difficult for them to put aside their differences for the sake of a larger vision. However, that started to change when a Delaware named Neolin had a dream and began traveling between villages, telling people about it. He explained that he met a being called the Master of Life in his dream. The Master of Life told Neolin that land in the Ohio Valley, where the Delaware tribe and others lived, was meant for his people, Indians, and no others. Neolin, also called the Delaware Prophet or the Impostor, even caught the attention of British and French settlers and traders who would travel to see him preach his message to the villages. Neolin was similar to the evangelists who traveled throughout the colonies during the Great Awakening. He spread a message of hope and salvation that could be achieved by giving up vices. The message spread through the Ohio Valley and Western tribes, including the Ottawa. The overall disappointment with British policies, the lack of respect the British gave the Indians, and Neolin's message provided a platform the Indians could unite behind. However, another issue that came up that affected them was land. As with many other situations related to the Indians, the British failed to comprehend how they utilized the land. 
The Indians were migratory and often trailed the animals that provided their food. Even if they did not occupy a certain region at a specific time, they still considered it their territory or hunting grounds. This was completely opposite to the British concept that land ownership was tied directly to occupancy. In the East, the situation with the land was further complicated by the idea that the Iroquois believed the British would push the French out and then return to the east side of the Allegheny Mountains. Not only did the British stay, but more colonists crossed the mountains and settled on the frontier. In the spring of 1763, war belts started circulating throughout the region called the Pays d'un Haut, the Upper Country. The region was located from the west of Lake Michigan to the east of Lake Ontario, near the Appalachian Mountains. It started as far north as the tip of Michigan and stretched south past Fort Pitt into Illinois and Ohio. In the west, Pontiac said he received war belts from the French. In the east, the Seneca sent a belt, probably done by their chief, Kiyashuta. Pontiac approved of taking action and started to speak out in favor of war against the British. His popularity grew, especially in the local villages of the Ottawas, Ojibwes, and Potawatomis. Pontiac's prominence grew, and he would command warriors from the villages in the Detroit area. He was an important leader in the western portion of the war. The Hurons also joined with Pontiac. All of these tribes lived in the Great Lakes region. Tribes from the Illinois country also joined with Pontiac's cause. They were the Miamis, Wees, Kickapoos, Mascutans, and Piankashaws. Out of the Ohio country came the Delawares, Shawnees, Wyandots, and Mingos. The idea that Pontiac was able to coordinate attacks throughout the entire region, from east to west, or that Kayashuta could do the same, is possible but unlikely. It is much more likely the French encouraged the Indians from New York to Michigan to rise in a way that made it seem like they were united in carrying out coordinated attacks. Further, the only Iroquois tribe, and the only tribe from outside the Pays des that was involved in the uprising, was the Seneca. The attack started with a surprise attack on Fort Detroit on May 9, 1763. Pontiac led roughly 300 warriors against the British. However, the plot was exposed, which helped the British prepare for the attack. Pontiac laid siege to the fort, which lasted until November. Similar attacks occurred throughout the Ohio country and western Pennsylvania during the spring and summer of 1763. In May, Indian forces captured Fort Sandusky in the Ohio country. Then, they captured Fort St. Joseph and Fort Miami. In June, a raiding party of Ottawa and Ojibwe warriors took Fort Michilimackinac. On June 22, 1763, a force of Delaware warriors attacked Fort Pitt and killed British settlers. In July, a British expedition escaped the Fort Detroit siege and tried to attack Pontiac's village. The Battle of Bloody Run took place on July 31, 1763 and resulted in heavy losses and a defeat for the British. In August, the Battle of Bushy Run took place when British forces under the command of Colonel Henry Bouquet clashed with Indian forces laying siege to Fort Pitt. The British were able to fight off the Indians and break the siege on August 20. In September, the Indian forces attacked a British supply train near Niagara Falls. The British sent reinforcements from Fort Niagara to aid the supply train. However, the British were badly beaten by the Indian force, which included warriors from the Seneca, Ojibwa, and Ottawa tribes. By the end of the fighting in 1763, the British had lost eight key forts along the frontier, including important positions at Presque Isle, Sandusky, and Michele Mackinac. In October 1763, the British government decided to take political action in an effort to put an end to the conflict. King George III issued the Proclamation of 1763, prohibiting colonists from settling west of the Appalachian Mountains. The lands to the west of the mountains, which the Indians were fighting to keep control of, were reserved for them as hunting grounds. The proclamation was largely aimed at restricting the colonists and helping keep the cost of defending the frontier to a minimum. Britain left roughly 5,000 troops west of the Appalachians to garrison the forts and defend the western frontier from potential attacks from the French, Spanish, and Indians. In December 1763,
colonists living in the village of Paxton on the Pennsylvania frontier conducted a raid on a settlement of the Conestoga tribe in Lancaster County. Six natives were killed and 14 were taken as prisoners and held in jail, only to be murdered about two weeks later by the so-called Paxton Boys. The Paxton Boys planned to attack a Moravian settlement, but the natives living there fled into Philadelphia for protection. In January 1764, the Paxton Boys marched on Philadelphia, where Benjamin Franklin and other city leaders met them. They were able to convince the mob to disperse. Despite the proclamation of 1763, the Indians continued to raid colonial settlements on the frontier and spread outside of the Pei Den Ho when settlers were attacked in Virginia and Maryland. Amherst was recalled to London in August 1763 and replaced by General Thomas Gage. Gage allowed William Johnson to negotiate a peace treaty with the tribes around Fort Niagara, which included the Seneca. In the fall of 1764, the British launched two military expeditions against the Indians. One was led by Colonel John Bradstreet and Colonel Bouquet led the other. The Indians were at a disadvantage, without their French allies supplying them with ammunition, which would have been a violation of the armistice between the French and the British. They would eventually be forced to surrender. Bradstreet traveled to Fort Presque Isle and negotiated a treaty with the Indians from the region, which he was not supposed to do. He was only authorized to negotiate a truce with them. The terms of the treaty promised Bouquet's expedition would not take place. Gage and other British leaders were outraged and had no intention of complying with the treaty. However, Bradstreet had no idea he had overstepped. He continued to Fort Detroit and negotiated a second treaty, but offended the tribal leaders with how he treated them. Bouquet left Fort Pitt on October 3 and marched into the Ohio country. He worked out an agreement with the tribes that ended the fighting and returned captives to their families. The tribes from the Ohio country met with William Johnson in July 1765 and worked out a formal peace treaty. Although Pontiac refused to surrender and continued to fight, his influence fell off. He tried to recruit tribes from further west and south, but the effort failed. The rebellion was over in the fall of 1764. In July 1766, Pontiac met with William Johnson at Fort Ontario and settled for peace with Johnson. The signing of the Treaty of Oswego officially ended the conflict. Pontiac received a pardon for his role in the affair. Pontiac's rebellion was initially successful, and American Indians captured most British forts. However, they could never capture Fort Pitt or Fort Detroit, and the rebellion against British rule gradually collapsed by the end of 1764. On that note, we end today's episode. Thank you for joining us once again. We hope you enjoyed this video. Remember to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you will be the first to see our new updates.